When I read the headlines this week that UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, was evicted from land stolen from the Veterans Administration to be used for housing homeless veterans, I was surprised, I'll admit. I mean, how did they get that land? Um, how were they evicted? Why were they evicted? And what did the landlord do to get them evicted, evicted when other tenants can't be evicted in Los Angeles? We're getting that in a deep way. I'm Bill Gross. This is my weekly real estate market update. I'm at Bill Gross Probate on social media or BillGrossProbate.com for more contact info. And we do this every week. I look into the real estate market first to make sure we understand where we are in the market with the data. So in an economy, I always explain there's two factors. Uh, there's, there's demand and supply. Demand would be uh, indicated in real estate by mortgage rates, so a spur demand or reduced demand. And inventory would be how many houses for sale. Let's take a look at demand. Interest rates, again, close slightly up 6.2 at the end of the week, about the same as the last couple of weeks. So inching up from a low of 6.11. So is significantly up, still at the lowest rates for the last year and a half. And so that's why we have many buyers looking at the limited properties for sale, even with the holidays coming up, even with schools starting back up. The interest rates we have today are still sufficient to cause a good buyer's market, I'm sorry, good buyer uh, demand and continuing us to be in a seller's market nationally. On the demand side, uh, I'm sorry, the inventory side, uh, you can see the inventory continues to drop slowly. We were at a high this year of 649,000. We're now down to 623. So we have 23,000 less homes than we had a few months ago. You can see that this last year at this time, the rate was still rising up. Not quite this level, but you can see here we're dropping down and traditionally it drops this time of year. So it seems to be headed towards about the same number as we were last year. And you'll notice the only other years in this range are pandemic years. These are still historic lows for other than the pandemic period and then last year right after and this year. I think the last two years were affected by the pandemic. We had less homes built. We have less inventory than we normally would have. And that still is, is not worked its way through the marketplace. So we still have very low inventory. And as long as that's the case, there's no way with low inventory, the housing prices can crash. Now, real estate is local. In Los Angeles, we continue to have a slight seller's market, as you can see in this chart, by outsource research. The key number here is 37. They take all the factors and come up with a number. And we've been at 37 now for a couple of weeks. It was, it was as high as, say, 41 uh, back in, um, I want to say June or July. Yeah, June. So it's been inching towards a more balanced market, but we're still on the seller's market side of the equation, but somewhat barely. So that's where the market is overall. Okay, let's talk about UCLA. Now, I will say on a personal level, um, I, I hate UCLA more than the average. I went to USC and didn't like the football team. That is true. Though I went to USC, I originally think I would still root for UCLA. I was a, I was a lifetime UCLA fan as a kid, uh, rooted for the Bruins basketball and football. But you know, of late, UCLA has really changed. You know, they're they're obviously anti-Semitic. They were sued to allow Jewish students to enter past the uh, uh, Palestinian protesters. They lost the lawsuit and appealed it. So they've really become an anti-Semitic cesspool. But this goes beyond that, but it's been gone on for a long time. I love the article I saw here. This was the LA Times beat writer. You can just see he's so disappointed. Usually the program will be locked out of a stadium. Oh, they're locked out. They're a victim, it sounds like. And then you see this picture, this guy in blue, and he looks disappointed. I think that's the baseball coach and maybe uh, an employee, but I'm not sure. In the powder blue, you can see there were national champions in 2013. So you see this disturbed person walking off the field. But what's the backstory of this? It's not just that UCLA uh, had some mishap happen to them. They finally got caught. And I think I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in a more general, but there was a lawsuit that was filed against UCLA. Uh, and if you read the details of the lawsuit, um, uh, the Veterans Administration had uh, been given land in the 1880s for the purpose of housing homeless veterans. And that's incredibly valuable land. It's at Wilshire Boulevard and Sepulveda, the 405 freeway in West Los Angeles. It's amongst the most viable land in all of Los Angeles. And you have this old, decrepit VA hospital building with this old, decrepit housing, this huge lot of land that's, that seems to be underutilized. And then you see on there some other industrial type buildings. And it turns out that over the years, UCLA was able to lease land there 
to put their baseball stadium, the Jackie Robinson Stadium. Now, they're a great baseball team in college, but does life need them when we literally have homeless veterans living on our streets? Which is more important? Well, the UCLA, it's more important to have their baseball stadium with a little more room and practice facilities. Additionally, the Brentwood School District, schools that are in the, well, they're public schools, they're in the wealthiest part of Los Angeles, serving the wealthiest people in LA. And their school district has their facilities on this land that was given by the federal government for the purpose of housing homeless veterans. On top of that, some of the land was leased to an oil company, making millions of dollars pumping oil. Now, you might say, that's interesting. Isn't the oil, wouldn't that be the uh, property of the federal government? Why are we giving the oil out or letting somebody else uh, lease land, land that should be used for veterans? You might have thought the oil company might have, as appreciation, built the housing for the veterans for free on top of land that they're pumping oil out of. But no. All anybody cares about here is getting the use of their land at the expense of our veterans for free. So you might say, well, this was some oversight. No, it was a lease. It's been there going on for 20, 30 years. But what's really reprehensible is when the lawsuit came through, and again, you say lost the lawsuit, the same attorneys that appealed for the right to discriminate against Jews on their campus and to restrict them from going to their schools, they thought, well, you know, we're going to appeal this decision because it's more important in the world to have our baseball stadium than it is to have land that could house homeless veterans. And so for those, for those of you driving around Los Angeles wondering, why in the heck are there people, homeless people, living on your streets, maybe living in parks near you, maybe living in front of your business? The answer is UCLA decided it was more viable to have a baseball stadium, and of course they have a fence around the stadium and they have security to keep the homeless out of their baseball stadium on the land that was given by the federal government for the sole purpose of housing our veterans. Really despicable. Now there's another angle of the story that I find fascinating, which is, okay, so the federal government finally did something right, I guess. They're gonna finally evict these deadbeat tenants, UCLA, and I guess the school and the oil company off of the land that's supposed to be given to housing. There were some agreements done, probably, and you know there are payoffs. You know that the guy who signed that lease, his kids went to UCLA, he got some favors from some of rich alumni. You know that was going on, right? I would have to, we went to guess about that. But you might say, well, how is it they got evicted? I mean, here in Los Angeles, you can't evict a tenant who's a deadbeat. They cannot pay their tax, their ta uh, rent. And you file a form and they ignore it. You file a form, you go to court, they get free legal help. Nowadays, they get help paid for by tax dollars to file lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit or, or complaint after complaint. And you know, my business has so many transactions that are held up where modest means or impoverished heirs inherit land, uh, inherit property they can't use because some deadbeat tenant's in there and refuses to move out. So the question is, how would you evict UCLA? This is probably the wealthiest tenant or one of the wealthiest tenants in Los Angeles. They have an endowment of $3 billion cash, which means they have so much money that they don't need to use. They put $3 billion in the bank just to collect interest for the long run, to live off the interest. It's not like a company with cash that has it there in case they, have it for, they need it for business purposes someday. This is, an industry, this is a uh, university that has an endowment. They, they don't even want the money. They just want the money in perpetuity to pay for expenses so they don't have to create value in the marketplace. Not to mention, they obviously have teams of attorneys. They're fighting Jews in one federal court. They're fighting the Veterans Administration in another court. They've got all kinds of legal attorneys. How do you get them out? Well, it's interesting. Because once the VA won the lawsuit, what they did when you say they locked them out is, well, who locked them out? Well, the answer is the Veterans Administration Police. And I didn't really think about this, but the Greater LA VA Department has 119 officers. And those officers have badges and guns. <laughs> so what they did was they put a fence around their property and said, get the heck out of here. And they patrol it. And they have policemen with guns and badges. And I just find it so interesting that when the government wants to do something, they've got men and badges at the ready to go out and evict people and enforce eviction. But when average people, homeowners who pay taxes, or property owners who pay taxes, uh, have legal standing to evict people, it's almost impossible. But I mean, good for the VA that they took advantage of the opportunity. But it is an interesting case that the government gives itself powers. It's supposed to get powers from the people. 
But instead, the government gives itself powers that it does not allow people to do. They restrict us as homeowners from evicting tenants who are there unlawfully, regularly. It's just, the whole thing is, it, it's just not even reasonable anymore. But here, that's how the VA got the property. So I found that fascinating as a way to get control of the property. If you have a gun and badge, you can get in. Okay, next, on the good news, though it's also kind of interesting uh, in some regards, uh, the LA City Council, which rarely approves housing unless there's payoffs for city council members, uh, sometimes in the form of low-income housing, uh, affordable housing, um, other names they use for government-involved housing. Here, the LA City Council approved a 200,000-square-foot uh, expansion at the USC Health uh, Campus, and I, Health Science Campus. And I would say, living in LA, if there's one bright spot in LA in my lifetime that's really turned from blight and, and ghetto, barrio, to fantastic. It's the UC Health Sciences facility in Boyle Heights. If you've not been by there, it is amazing. Now, what's interesting is there's not a lot of fancy restaurants and bars and all those things. There are jobs. There are health facilities. I actually go there for most of my medical care. I have everything uh, in, in, that you can imagine. The very advanced um, uh, of every cancer center and general hospital and all kinds of stuff. And they also have housing because they have so much research and so many students being taught there. So you have housing. Now, they do have some commercial, but it's not like Westwood or it's not like, you know, uh, Third Street where it's a whole retail life there. There's enough, I imagine, for people who live there. But it really is creating demand for services in the area, the markets that are there, the stores that are there, uh, the housing that's there. So it is really exciting to see. It's really changed that market, and the values in that area have exploded. And if you're looking for a place to speculate on land, those undeveloped lots around L.A., now there's some really weird zoning and weird land and weird pieces in the roads because it was done so long ago. But I know people making a fortune figuring that out as well as uh, investing in property units over there, very valuable, because we have these kind of jobs coming in. You're going to have high-priced high employees who need to live somewhere, and they're going to pay uh, top market rents, and that's what's happening in that market. So again, worth looking into. It's interesting. The city will approve health sciences for USC, uh, but it, they're not approving uh, housing for our residents. Okay. Where's the demand for housing? I found an interesting article this week by Lance Lambert. Lance is a really sharp guy. He has his own um, news source now called the Resi Club. And he, what he documented was the rent increases. And what you'll notice, I find fascinating, is while overall rents have gone up, about 3%, multifamily, which means apartment units, went up 2.6% in the last year, but single family 4.5%, which means there's still more demand for houses versus apartments. And what you see throughout our government uh, in L.A. and in Southern California and California overall is a real push to force people into apartments, force them into condos, force them into stacked high rises near metro centers. But that's not what people want. And the numbers are screaming that despite all the propaganda, despite all the difficulty, despite the rise in prices, people are willing to and want to still have their own house or their own yard, their own fence to call theirs. And the numbers, uh, the increase in rent differential, I think, is a is an easy number that points out how valuable that is to people. Um, okay, also the news, I've talked quite a bit about the recent uh, settlement by National Association of Realtors and how that affects people. And here's an interesting article. A month later, Housing Wire uh, is quoting a, story, a study by the Real, the Real Brokerage that says a month into this, uh, two things are true. One, commission rates haven't changed. The big lie was that sellers were overpaying buyer commission, uh, commissions to buyer's agents. The reality is somebody's got to pay a buyer who brings, I'm sorry, somebody has to pay the, the agent who brings the buyer to the party. The listing agent and the buyer agent can work together uh, or somebody can do it on their own. But when we delegate the jobs and work together, we're more effective. The result is at least a month into this so far, no change in commission. And the second is most sellers understand that and are willing to pay a portion of the buyer's agent commission. And so for all the drama, and that's my experience and the offers I've seen, buyers are willing to pay their agent that they think that they will represent them. And in turn, when we get an offer from a good agent who knows what they're doing, my seller's willing to pay a fair portion. And I've already agreed to pay a fair portion to the other agent. Or I should say, I've agreed to reduce my commission to, pay, to create the revenue 
uh, for a fair portion of the buyer's agent. So here we are after all the hullabaloo. The only thing I think that's true, two things are true as a result of that lawsuit. One is it's wasted tremendous time, energy, and effort that's given, that's resulting in losses to agents at the expense of these corporate monopolies. And second, customers are ill-served as agents are wasting their time. They have less time to serve their customers. And those things are, I think, inarguable. Okay, also in the news, my favorite, the gift that keeps on giving as far as a podcast or a, a content provider like me is, is Governor Gavin Newsom. So here we have Serious Gavin. The LA Times is trying to make him look serious now. And I love the headline. They have to, you always have to read the stuff with a critical eye. In an effort to create more affordable homes, Governor Newsom signs package of housing bills. Now, first off, he's, the, fact, the truth is he signed a package. That's, that's true. Is it an effort to create more affordable homes? Now, he's of homes. He's pretended, or I should say, he's lied to us, or that's harsh. He's said he's working on creating more affordable housing for 10 years. And not only has he not delivered on that, housing has become less affordable consistently year over year. Not only that, he's promised for 10 years to get rid of homelessness. And not only has that not happened, the exact opposite has happened for 10 years, gotten worse. I'm in business. Now, I'm not a politician. In business, we judge a tree by its fruit. And when a, a politician like Governor Newsom has consistently only delivered policies that made housing worse, you don't let them get away with saying they're going to make it better. So to me, the headline is just the LA Times in its normal role as a propaganda tool for the governor and the state and local government. Because clearly nothing they do. I'll give you a couple of reasons why I think this is not true. One is, how many laws do you think he signed on this day? The answer I find it staggering, 32. He signed 32 different laws. Now, part of why they do that is, rather than put together a package of 32 items, the Democrats, or I should say the, the politicians, each of them went through glory for their own law. And so one of the things in California, since we no longer have two parties, we only have one party, the Democratic Party, one way they used to create the, um, the, the appearance of doing something is they, they uh, su support or um, they put forth so many different laws, one per person, so each of them get a little bit of credit. So if 32 uh, laws are signed, uh, I'm in real estate, I can't tell you what half of them do. I looked at this article and other places, I can't identify what they were. And I'm sure a lot of them affect my business and my client's business. But we're at a point now we have so many laws being created, nobody can keep up with them all. Also, here's a question, did Governor Newsom read any of them? I have 32 laws. I imagine each one's, I don't know, 30, 50, 100 pages. How many do you think he really read in between campaigning across the country? Answer, I bet not one. I, I bet not one. I bet it's not in his calendar to spend an hour a week to read through these, petition, these uh, laws. But anyhow, it's designed. Now, how do we know? As I said to you, in business, we judge a tree by its fruit. Here's a fascinating story of Governor Newsom. One of his big pushes, if you live in California, you're aware of, uh, now, this is a different picture. This is from a conservative side that gives you the, the evil Ga Gavin look with a slick hair and the Joker-like smile. But he also banned plastic bags in California, right? So he'll say he's banning plastic bags in California. But the truth is, we've actually had 10 years of plastic bans, uh, I'm sorry, plastic limitations, where we had to pay. If you, go to, if you buy groceries, you know, I just did it. You have to pay like 10 cents a bag uh, and you get a choice of paper or plastic, and they're, they're, they're ridiculously expensive because you're going to reuse them. And it turns out nobody reuses the plastic. So the ones that they sell are twice as thick as the ones we used to use. And the result is the average household in California, even for those people who do recycle, I hate to tell you, on average, our per person plastic use doubled. It went from like five pounds to 10 pounds in the last 10 years. And that's because people will use the plastic of the um, bags from the, the, the vegetable area or the fruit area, use those bags for their products. Also, because people bring reusable bags, the products are in more plastic to protect them from getting dirty in reusable bags, which have all kinds of problems. So here, here's my point. This is called the, either the law of unintended consequences or just lying. Meaning either Governor Newsom does want to eliminate plastic and he's just so stupid that the lie passed 10 years ago made the problem twice as bad. And now he thinks he's smart enough to figure out how to solve the problem. That's one, he's just stupid. Okay, I'll go with that. Or two, 
The whole thing is just dishonest. In reality, he hasn't carried the way about plastic, but the plastic bag makers are giving him money, campaign contributions, hire his family, give grants to his uh, whatever. And as a result, he's fine with that law. Same with the housing laws. Uh, is, is he stupid that in, in 10 years he's made both those worse? Or is he uh, dishonest? Uh, and as a result of graft, and each law has so much graft built in, it makes the situation worse. I'll let you decide. In fact, put in the comments. Is Governor Newsom stupid? Or is Governor Newsom completely incompetent? Um, oh, that's not right. Is he stupid and competent? Or is he so competent that he's just a liar and things are getting worse on purpose while he gets rich? I'd be curious. Or maybe you have a third answer. If you have a third answer, put that in the comments as well. I'd love to see it. So I think my point of all that is to say, when the government says they're going to fix the housing problem, don't believe it. When the government says they're going to fix the homeless problem, everything they touch gets worse. The key would be for the government to give back more money to its citizens and let us solve the problem. And that's the beauty of real estate. We can make housing more, more affordable by buying good housing, keeping it in good repair, and offering it to the marketplace at fair prices and doing a good job of that. And we can do that also by creating a good business where people make money and as a result save money, can buy property for them, their families to live in. Clearly people want to pursue the American dream. So what should you do? Well, again, don't get discouraged by the government. You do you. Uh, it's a great opportunity for investing in real estate. There's great opportunities for buying houses today. If I can help in any way, call, text, or email. I'm at Bill Gross Probate in social media. And as always, make today your best day ever. Thanks so much.